Welcome to the next lecture for our class. It's lecture number 10, Congress 2, Lawmaking. Today's lecture is pretty straightforward. What you want to be able to do by the end of the presentation today is to be able to explain how a bill becomes a law. You want to be able to identify and explain the six steps with lawmaking. So before we get started on some of those specific steps, I did want to start with two concepts. First of all, for a bill to become a law, a majority vote in support of a proposal is needed in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Secondly, the House and Senate version of a bill has to be exactly the same. So if they support a tax increase, let's just say, the House and the Senate have to support it at the same level. All the I's have to be dotted the same. All the T's have to be crossed the same. Okay? So these are two key concepts. Well, let's start with step number one. Essentially, the approach here is to kind of fill out a chart. Um, and this one deals with the first step, the introduction of a bill. And what we're going to see is what happens in the House of Representatives what happens in the Senate, and what, if any, role the President has in each of these steps. Often, you'll see that the House and the Senate have similar things going on, but sometimes there's a slight difference. Are any of you familiar with Schoolhouse Rock? Well, um, one of my favorites from that program from the 1970s was uh, I'm Just a Bill, and it offers really the best three-minute description of how a bill becomes a law that I've ever seen. If you'd like, um, you can click on one of the hyperlinks that are on the Canvas site, and you can see this. Uh, I think it can help to provide a little bit of a humorous approach to uh, learning about um, how a bill becomes a law. All right, so I'd like to go back to that chart now, and what we're going to see is what happens in the first step when it comes to lawmaking, and that's the introduction of a bill. First of all, in the House and the Senate, a bill is given a number when it's introduced. The President can propose legislation when it comes to uh, lawmaking, but the President has no actual power to introduce a bill on the floor of either the House or the Senate. Another thing that happens in this first step, the introduction of a bill, would be that the proposal would be read out loud whether it deals with education, American foreign policy, uh, tax on uh, estates, or whatever the issue may be, it gets read out loud. It could be the entire bill, but often what happens is that an executive summary is uh, read out loud, and then the rest of it is entered into the record. The president can propose legislation, but the president has no actual power to go on the floor of the House or the Senate to officially introduce a bill. So I'd like to start with a fictional bill. We'll give it a number. We'll call it House Resolution, or HR, number 755. And our proposal, well, we'll keep it simple. Let's raise the minimum wage to $20 an hour. Now the goal of one legislator might be to increase the minimum wage, but there's one additional thing that needs to happen after a bill has been read out loud in this first step with lawmaking. The additional thing that needs to happen is that the proposal itself needs to be referred to a committee. There are numerous committees in both the House and the Senate. Much of the work in Congress takes place in these different committees. The images shown here identify some of the major committees in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House currently has 20 standing committees, and there are some others that are listed here uh, that are additional committees, and a standing committee is one that's a permanent committee and an important one in the House as well as the Senate. The Senate has 16 standing committees. It's very difficult for all of the members of the Senate or all of the members of the House to look at the strengths and the weaknesses of a bill as it's being proposed, so much of the work of Congress takes place in these committees. All right, so the second step in the lawmaking process would be the committee phase. Depending upon the focus of a particular bill, uh, that proposal might get sent to an education committee. Um, in our case, uh, the um, proposal to raise the minimum wage, it might get sent to a commerce committee. 
So that committee would then have jurisdiction in the House and in the Senate. There are a few things that have to happen in this committee phase. In both the House and the Senate, hearings and markup take place. Once again, we're going to see how the president has very little power or authority when it comes to this committee phase. I'd like to define hearings and markup in the next couple of slides. The images here on the left show some examples of hearings. Hearings are meetings which are open to the public where members of the House and the Senate would interview individuals, they would call upon experts in a particular field, and those experts would testify as to the strengths and the weaknesses of a bill that's been proposed. Congress wants to look at the strengths and weaknesses because an original proposal might need to be modified or even thrown out uh, based upon the expert testimony at these hearings. Markup would take place after those hearings. The image on the right here shows an original proposal that literally was marked up with some of the changes and modifications that probably were recommended at the hearings. So if you think of it this way, think of a sheet of paper with an original proposal on it and those bills provisions are initially written in there, well, they're often rewritten and modified based upon the expert testimony of people at those hearings. In fact, most of the bill's specific provisions are actually written in this committee phase during markup as opposed to when the bill was originally um, uh, introduced in the House or the Senate. So let's go back to that original bill to raise the minimum wage. Based upon the expert testimony of those hearings, our bill will probably get marked up. So maybe the $20 an hour was a little bit too high, so maybe the suggestion is to lower that to 15. And what about people who are working over 40 hours a week? Maybe a new provision would be added to the original proposal offering $20 an hour for people working overtime. Hearings are held and markup takes place during this second step or the committee phase, but there's something else that takes place as well. Another thing that happens in this committee phase is that the members of the committee make a recommendation and they vote. They might vote to approve or to kill a proposal. If they support it, then they'll vote to approve it. If they don't support it, they might kill it. Here is a statistic. About 95% of all bills that have been introduced, they've been read out loud, they've been referred to a committee, about 95% of those bills die in committee. Often what might happen is that you may have three or four or five different versions of a proposal, whether it's a tax cut, whether it's a new regulation um, when it comes to environmental laws, uh, or whether it's a new proposal to uh, help um, provide aid to business owners and things like that but about 95% of all bills die in committee. If a proposal is approved by at least a majority of the members of a committee in the United States Senate, then we would move on to step number three. However, there's one last thing that has to happen if you're in the House of Representatives. In the House, there's a rules committee, and so the rules committee would establish rules for debate. Generally speaking, what the, this House committee would do is they would establish uh, a time limit um, on the amount of time that the bill can be debated and whether or not it can be changed or amended by other members of the House um, uh, during uh, when they take up uh, a proposal. As long as a majority of the members of the committee in either the House or the Senate support a proposal, then we would move on to step number three. This allows the full House, or all the members of the House, and all the members of the Senate to address a bill that's under consideration. So, what happens here? Well, in the House and the Senate, it would be debate. Once again, the President has no specific power or authority when it comes to this step number three. Um, debate in the House of Representatives tends to be very strict and limited. However, something can happen in the United States Senate when it comes to debate, and I'd like to talk about that next. If a senator is strongly opposed to a proposal, 
a senator can stage a filibuster. This is when one senator, or possibly a group of senators, engage in continuous speech. It can bring all Senate activity to a complete halt. This can happen only if a senator keeps talking and they remain standing. In the past, they've read things like the United States Constitution, they've read the Bill of Rights, they've even read the Washington DC phone book. However, today they generally simply talk and talk and talk and talk about an issue in hopes that their obstructionist tactics could um, bring all discussion uh, to an end because they're strongly opposed to a particular proposal. There is a way to end a filibuster, however. That's called a cloture vote. If 60 senators support an end to a filibuster, the individuals engaged in the filibuster can only continue their continuous speech for an additional 20 hours. Then they have to stop. And that's called, again, a cloture vote. Any piece of legislation has the potential to take away our rights, so that's why the, the ability to stage a filibuster is an important part of the Senate workings. We've had a variety of filibusters in the past. Possibly one of the most famous filibusters never was real. It was in a movie from 1939, and it was called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. The longest filibuster in American history was... Uh, undertaken by Strom Thurmond in the 1950s. He was opposed to some civil rights legislation and he took the floor of the Senate and he held it for 24 hours and 18 minutes. In recent years, we've seen a couple of filibusters. Um, on the right, we see an image of Rand Paul, a senator from Kentucky. He was opposed to the use of the drone strikes uh, by the Obama administration, and he wanted a clarification as to whether or not an American citizen could be a victim of a drone strike. Um, another example in the fall of 2013 is that Senator Ted Cruz was opposed to the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, and he staged a filibuster of about 21 hours. In addition to debate, something else happens with step number three when the full House and Senate get to address a proposal, and that would be earmarking. Earmarking is when a member of the House or the Senate include a specific project in a bill that's under consideration. Um, Usually they want to do this because maybe it will provide a special tax break for, to a company in their district or maybe it's funding for a project um, in, in their state uh, that would help to bring money and or jobs to their state. A slang term associated with earmarking would be pork barrel projects because some of these projects are really good projects and they do a good job of beautifying a state or maybe they help with the state park system or something along those lines but they can also be wasteful and so that's why currently there are restrictions placed on these so-called earmarks uh, and a lot of people are upset about them but uh, sometimes they can be good sometimes they can be wasteful but the pig here shows this uh, pork barrel interpretation of wasteful spending associated with Congress. Not all of these earmarks are wasteful. Um, I remember a few years ago there was a press conference at West Shore Community College because one of the specific earmarks included in a piece of legislation was a specific amount of $400,000 that West Shore Community College received in order to retrain displaced workers. Um, uh, there was a high unemployment rates and Congressman Hoekstra, who was the congressman at the time, was able to get $400,000 earmarked for West Shore Community College. Other examples of earmarks would be Manistee's uh, Hospital and Manistee's Blacker Airport, I know, have received earmarks in the past. Um, Ludington's Harbor, Pentwaters Harbor, Manistee's Harbor, all the way up to Frankfurt, um, there have, in the past, there have been specific earmarks in order to dredge those harbors because they fill up with silt and it can be difficult for large barges to come in um, with their, their goods uh, and to leave. Um, and actually, this can be a barrier for local businesses. And so that's why uh, those earmarks are included and, and have helped uh, a lot of local businesses in the past. Okay, after all of the debating, after any new provisions may or may not have been added to a proposal, the last thing that happens with step number three would be a vote.
a majority vote in support of that proposal would be needed to go to step number four. That's required in both the House and the Senate. Well, our bill to raise the minimum wage has made it, um, but only through the House of Representatives. Uh, so once a bill passes one chamber, it has to be sent to the other chamber. So our bill is now passed the House. Next, it goes on to the Senate. Once the bill goes to the Senate, it goes through the process all over again. So it's given a number. We'll call it Senate Bill number 130. And they support raising the minimum wage, but they're not as generous as the House. Let's just pretend that their argument is to raise the minimum wage to $10 an hour. They support overtime, but again, for um, at the rate of $15 an hour. Something's passed the House, that's great, and it's passed the Senate, but they're not exactly the same. That will take us to the next step. That's step number four. Step number four is called the conference phase. This would be necessary if similar bills pass in both the House and the Senate, but they're not exactly the same. What happens here is that a committee made up of a handful of the members of the House, maybe three or four, and a handful of members of the Senate, again, maybe three or four, what they do is they sit down and they try to work out a compromise on the different versions of the bills. Once again, the president can talk about the importance of a proposal. He could try to lobby members of Congress in support or opposition to something that's under discussion. But the president has no specific power or authority in step number four. So in the conference phase, a handful of the members of the House and Senate agree to compromise. Let's just say that they support a minimum wage. This group uh, gets together and they say, well, we'll support a $12.50 an hour minimum wage. And then again, they get together and they say, well, we'll support an increase in overtime pay to $17.50. That's great. They've worked out a compromise. That conference phase is important because that small committee has worked out any of the differences between the two proposals and they've compromised. However, only a handful of the members of the House and the Senate have approved that. Well, as long as they work out the differences in the compromise, that would take us to step number five. Step number five allows all of the members of the House of Representatives and all of the members of the Senate the opportunity to vote in favor of or to reject the compromise version that had been developed by the conference committee. Once again, the president has no specific power or authority in step number five. As long as there's a majority vote in support of the proposal at this point, Finally, we get to go to step number six, which is the last step. Step number six finally allows the president some actual authority. The House and the Senate have proposed a bill, they've agreed to it, and they send it off to the president. If a bill is made it this far and it gets sent to the president, the president has three options. First, the president can sign a bill, he can veto it if he's opposed to it, or the president can do nothing. If the president signs a bill, once it's done, that bill becomes a law. If the president is opposed to a proposal, the president can veto it. If the president vetoes a bill, it gets returned to Congress, and Congress has the option of voting on it again. Even if the president is opposed to a bill, Congress can still take up that proposal. They vote on it again. And if a two-thirds majority of the members of the House of Representatives support that proposal, and a two-thirds majority in the Senate also concur and support it, that presidential veto is overridden or overruled. There's one last action that the president can take. The president can do nothing. If the president does nothing, 
Well, I'll tell you about that when I focus on the presidency. I'm going to make you wait. I'm sure you're excited to learn what happens if the president does nothing. But when I address the president and lawmaking, I will make sure to go into much more detail on this. So here we are back to that chart. If the president issues a veto, a veto override vote is taken in both the House and the Senate. And if they vote to override the presidential veto by that two-thirds majority, a bill can become a law even without the president's authority or approval. We're just about done, but let's have a little bit of review next. So this lecture addressed how a bill becomes a law. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to write an essay explaining how this process by identifying each of the six steps. And then you want to evaluate. Do you think this is a good process? Do you think it's bad? What are some strengths and weaknesses? That's what you'd like to do on, as one of your possible essay questions for the next exam. Well, that's all for today. Please feel free if you have any questions to post them to Canvas. Send me a note. Take care. Have a great day.